but I thank you so much for tuning in this afternoon. Um, it's my name is Amy Rothenberg. I'm a naturopathic doctor, and um, I am thrilled to be here with the Institute for Natural Medicine talking about calming the anxious child. Naturopathic doctors have been working with um, with families and with, with children who have anxiety since the beginning of naturopathic medicine. And we really work to understand anxiety in the context of the whole child and to understand that child in the context of the whole family. Um, our treatment approaches really emphasize lifestyle and gentle natural medicines. And I would like to just start out with some very general concepts of how to raise a healthy kid who's not so anxious and to really give us a sense of how we look at an anxious child from a naturopathic perspective. Um, I'm, I'm curious, um, probably some of you who are on the call have anxious children, and it's possible that some of you um, yourself are anxious. And I, we had, did a little poll here at the beginning, and I would say uh, some of you are still fitting, filling that in, but I can say that really the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and that sometimes kids who are super anxious, and we see anxiety starting really with newborns. So I mean, you can see a very anxious little baby. You can see anxious toddlers. You can certainly see anxious preschoolers and school age kids all the way up to uh, teens and adults. So uh, in the poll that we did, we have about 15% of people said that they'd really never struggled with anxiety. And about 30, 40% have said, uh, close to 40% that they, you know, previously struggled with anxiety, but not currently. And about a third of you have said that you are currently also anxious. So I think a lot of the materials that I will talk about here today are um, will be relevant also for those of you who are struggling with anxiety as adults. So um, let's see. We know our kids are anxious when they tell you. Some kids are old enough to just tell you. Some kids have a hard time focusing or diagnosed with other things, ADD, ADHD. Some kids have appetite changes, changes in sleep. They become very rigid about what they need to get done. Uh, they can become more, more um, agitated when corrected. Some kids have different kinds of emotional outbursts. Um, we can have lots of crying, being clingy, feeling restless and fidgety. And then we can also have a whole slew of physical body kind of complaints that are not explained by something else. So digestive complaints, headaches, skin problems, hives, um, lots of muscle tension in different parts of the body, hair loss is another uh, way that anxiety can present, tummy aches, um, and other symptoms that are not explained by other physical kinds of um, problems. Anxiety is increasingly common in children. Our, today, you know, with, through the pandemic, of course, we have heightened anxiety in children and adults. About six in 10 kids um, who complain of anxiety at a doctor's office will get treatment, the others not so much. We know that kids who are living on the poverty line in more disadvantaged upbringings tend to have more anxiety. Um, that's definitely true. And there is a movement to integrate more assessment of the, uh, the child's psychological state in the pediatric office. And of course, naturopathic doctors, we've always been interested in that. We really look at the whole child. And if I'm taking the case of a kid who comes in for another kind of complaint, asthma, eczema, autoimmune disease, what have you, I'm also very interested in their psycho-emotional state because that's going to be a big part of what impacts their health. Um, you know, I would say that naturopathic approaches can help any anxious child to some degree or another. Some kids become not anxious. Other kids just learn lots of tools to help prevent, raise their threshold so they don't feel as anxious. And then we have some kids who really continue to struggle and have overlapping psychiatric diagnoses. And these are the kids who we work best with other providers, psychologists and psychiatrists who have expertise in treating children. So we don't, nature of the doctors work very well in the sandbox with other providers. And I think many kinds of approaches together can be complementary. And some parents in my practice will say to me, well, I don't really want my son to get a diagnosis. And I always say, well, you know, if you get a diagnosis, a lot of times you have more access to different services in your community. And so we shouldn't necessarily, you know, steer clear of diagnoses. We don't want to label kids and have problems with self-esteem related to labels. There's certainly those considerations to take into account. But I would say that as a rule, uh, we don't shy away from diagnoses. 
we try to really help families model language to describe a wide range of emotions that is age appropriate. Some of the more nuanced feelings that are related to anxiety, I've listed out here, worried, stressed, restless, fearful, apprehensive, uneasy, concerned. And we can use language like that when we're with children to try to get a sense. We have to model that language, of course, when we're in our own lives. You know, I'm feeling really anxious today. You know, your sister's late getting home or, or whatever it is so that we are giving voice and we're giving language and words to the feelings. And this many times helps prevent the uncomfortable feelings coming out sideways, either in poor behaviors or in physical body illnesses. So we want to make time and space to have conversations or that involve feelings um, without spending our whole life doing that. That gets a little bit old too. And of course, this is all done in, without any judgment. You know, kids are kids and they're, they're trying their hardest too. Uh, one resource I found tremendous, I, I'm a mother of three wonderful adult kids now, uh, but one of the, my parenting Bibles, and there are many, many good books on parenting, but one that describes really a way to communicate that models the embracing of and the capacity for naming and enabling our children to name and articulate their feelings is a book called How to Talk So Your Kids Listen and Listen So Your Kids Talk. And there are lots of resources around that book and, and some things you can find online. It's, it's very easy. Once you hear the recommendations, you think, oh my God, why didn't I think of that? It's all quite logical and, and things that you can integrate tomorrow um, in terms of speaking with your kids to get some better communication going. I think that, you know, for naturopathic doctors, we're very interested in the environment, both the external environment, the internal environment, the microbiome, of course, which we'll talk about in a little while. But in terms of the external environment, there are things that you can really think about to help your anxious children. One thing is to look at your own anxiety. If you're an anxious person, you come from a long line of anxious people, you know, that something your kids come in and potentially hardwired. So you have to really take responsibility for your own anxiety and try not to act and be and express your anxiety, you know, 24 seven to your kid. Less mess, less clutter, if possible. You know, we are a society of people who like to buy things and put things in our homes. Kids who are anxious tend to do better when there's less around, at least create a space where there's less clutter for that child. Um, it's very hard right now during the pandemic, but in general, the idea of creating a schedule that you can write, you can put it big up on a board, you can have kids check things off as they do them. Children, like a lot of adults too, do better when the, when the anticipation is lowered, when the expectations are understood and when they're repeated and clear and accessible and they make sense. So you can also, as kids get older, you know, we always said when we were raising our family that when they were little, it was sort of like a benevolent dictatorship. But by the time they got to be 18 or 20, it had to be a little bit more of a democracy and they couldn't get there overnight. So as kids get a little older, you can give them some choices and they can have some role in trying to create a schedule that works for their, um, their body clock or works for their preferences. You know, we ourselves have to be less rigid and listen to our kids in terms of what might work for them. Another thing that I would say is that, especially during our crazy times right now, there are so many external stressors. Those are on top of whatever an individual family has as their personal family stressors. And so taking an assessment of your big stressors, trying not to have conversations around those things with the kids in front of you. They don't need to hear all those details. They really don't. Um, I think taking a news fast can be very helpful today. And uh, during this time, the news is there's not a lot good on the news right now. Um, there are ways of also creating nice environments through using peaceful music, lowering the volume of your voice, slowing the pace of the way that you speak, not my specialty, um, lowering the lights, especially as the, the light is going out of the day. You can diffuse, uh, use a diffuser, use things like lavender oil. There are ways of creating a more harmonious and peaceful environment, even just within your own home. Uh, and then I just want to talk about all different kinds of activities that lead to less anxious kids. Basic ideas. First thing you want to do with an anxious kid is ask yourself, when's the last time they ate? When's the last time they slept? And when's the last time I gave them 10 minutes of my undivided attention? And the reason that we want to do this is because they, if any of these things are not being addressed, then they, you know, you, you might just cut off a lot of the anxiety if you can address, get them something to eat, time for a nap. Let me sit down, let's read a book together. 
And, you know, remember hugs and snuggle time. Kids need a lot of affection and attention. Especially the younger they are, some, some kids just temperamentally need more touch. Remember the whole idea of laughter and humor. You can, you can be silly together. You can do th things that you know bring your child joy. You can make time for that. Funny books and, and movies, of course, age appropriate. Um, you can bring in other loving adults, sometimes just bringing in anybody else, an aunt, an uncle, an older cousin, some, somebody that, that your child can have another adult child relationship with a lot of times can be helpful. And then sometimes in the moment of a, a child feeling very anxious or very afraid of a thing, sometimes we can distract them with a compliment. Uh, oh my goodness, I didn't realize how much you, you, you learned how to tie your shoes. Where did you learn how to tie your shoes? You can distract them. You can distract them with a call for help unrelated to them. You can ask them around, uh, oh my goodness, I need some help unloading the dishwasher. Please come quick, I need some help. Sometimes children who are anxious, they actually are also anxious to help others. So you, if you distract, that sometimes can head off a whole spiraling down of anxiety. And of course you want to seek balance between using distraction approaches and acknowledging and naming, articulating, feelings and trying to create strategies to address the feelings. Another thing that's incredibly important with relationship between uh, activities is physical exercise. Um, the, the essential rule is, is proven over and over again, both in the prevention of anxiety and treatment of anxiety. He's here for families and working with kids who are anxious, doing things together as a family, modeling, getting exercise yourself, uh, introducing new things that maybe your child had never tried before. Uh, of course, watch, uh, watch overheating in the coming summer, bring snacks, bring water. I've listed out here a number of things that our family enjoy doing together, but obviously this list is, is pretty um, endless. I think the key here is trying new things and finding something that your child enjoys. Don't forget the role of life skills. For, for many children, as well as adults, there can be a calming effect. Of course, not if it's drudgery and you're the only one doing it, but the things that have to be done day in, day out, dishwashing and folding laundry, sweeping, dusting, things like that, organizing a clock, fixing things. I mean, the kids can do quite a lot. They can certainly go and grab you the hammer. They can learn how to use a screwdriver. They can, as they get older, they can learn how to use a power drill. These are things that First of all, it's togetherness time, and it also gives kids some skills that they actually can use as they grow up, and it can distract them from anxiety, and it can get them feeling like they are contributing, which is an important piece for everybody. Don't forget about the role of pets. You might not be an animal person yourself, but for a very anxious kid needing to care for a dog or a hamster or a bunny or a cat, and of course, you're going to have to be the backup care, so don't take it on if you can't take it on. But this can be very a very calming touchstone for a child, and it also teaches caring for others, teaches about love, teaches about gentleness, which are other good life skills that help people who are anxious. Another thing that's very uh, big in the news right now and big in research is the role of time outdoors and how this has a positive impact on mental health, including prevention and treatment of anxiety. So first of all, it ensures time away from screens, we know that sunshine activates vitamin D, which is essential for oral health and, and many um, biochemical pathways. And in the outdoors, we have many opportunities to learn that we don't have inside in terms of just pointing things out, observing. I, I often would be sort of the, the narrator when my kids were young. Oh my goodness, look at that row of trees. They're all bending to the side with the wind. Or, or oh my God, look at the rabbit over there, whatever it is. And if you live in the city and don't have access to really large, you know, kind of outdoor green spaces, there's still lots to see in the city in terms of, oh my goodness, look at the little flowers that they've planted around these trees here. I wonder how many colors you can find in the flowers. And you can, any opportunity with children, especially young ones, to educate and uh, bring their mind and their eye and their ears, their senses to their surroundings can help reduce anxiety because it's taking them out of their own head into something else. Some of the games that our family enjoyed uh, playing with kids outdoors. We love playing I Spy. We'd love to make treasure hunts. Uh, we learned, taught our kids how to lose, use field guides, which is not for everybody, but we love that. Of course, hide and go seek uh, if, if it's safe for your kids is a wonderful thing. And then there are other things that are known as, as calming pursuits. Meditation, uh, like benefits of things like writing and journaling, uh, writing groups for kids, reading groups for kids, drawing, making things, you know, having that little area 
that you put aside on, on a kitchen counter or in one of your areas in your home where there can be glue sticks and scissors and staplers and paper. And you know, kids generally like to make things if they're given the opportunity, if you model it a little bit and you give them some direction, but a lot of freedom and very little judgment. Uh, cooking and baking would certainly fall under this category. Um, making or listening to music, using video, making videos, photographs, learning to program. There's so many things. And, you know, as adults, we understand this concept of being in the zone and little kids do too. And that's when you have the little kid in the zone working with the blocks or the older kid who's nine or 10 and, in, you know, spends two or three hours putting together a Lego set, or you have a teenager who's just in the zone learning a chord progression on the guitar. I mean, being in the zone like that is probably one of the best antidotes for anxiety for all of us. And for anxious kids, a lot of anxious kids are they, they lack self agency and they, they, one of the things that the parents job is and the doctor's job is, is to give recommendations to help give kids a little bit more self agency. So one of the ways we do this, we resist constantly correcting and we set and stick with our expectations. We tone down our criticism and we literally watch the tone of our voice. Kids that don't feel great about themselves oftentimes will respond to a harshness in tone of voice and take it personally. We wanna take encourage kids to take healthy risks, learn thing, new things, reach out to others. Um, and I also really like taking the flip side of anxiety and introducing the idea of helping others, developing a posture of gratitude, perhaps family, community service, helping a neighbor. And that's gratitude in both words and deeds, learning how to write a thank you note, that's an essential skill that we want all of our kids to learn. Okay, uh, we have a, a first question here that is, it says, uh, how do the suggestions you make change when we're talking about adolescents? They don't really change. Uh, we still wanna have routines for our adolescents and teenagers. We still wanna have expectations. We have to be a little more flexible. I think with adolescents, we have to set times to have conversations. We can't, if a kid is in their own head, dealing with their friends and uptight about a school thing, you know, hey, we need to set aside time to talk. What's gonna work good for you? tomorrow morning or Saturday afternoon. You can give them some choice, just like you asked that toddler, okay, honey, which pair of pants do you need to put on? You wanna put on your red ones or you wanna put on your green ones? You give them some choice, but there's gonna be a conversation. And then you have a list and you just put, you you have the contracts. I have some resources at the end here about uh, particularly cell phone contracts with teenagers. Mindfulness skills with kids. You know, I feel like right now, everybody's learning mindfulness meditation, breathing exercises, affirmations. There are so many approaches that we can use with children. I have a whole list of resources that will be available to people who have tuned in that you can use. And if you yourself are uncomfortable meditating, learn how to do it with your kids. There's meditation for teenagers and meditation for tiny little ones. So I think this is an area, first of all, it's almost free. Everything's either free or low cost and there's no side effects and it's effect across a person's both physical, mental, and cognitive areas is unparalleled. So this is a very important piece of working with our anxious kids. I have a, a book here uh, to refer you to called Alpha Breaths. This is great for literally babies all the way up to, you know, uh, adults like this book too. It's very cute. It goes through the alphabet in different kind of, um, you know, A is for alligator. The arms open big and wide like an alligator mouth. You take a deep breath in and then out. And they do one for each letter of the alphabet. Kids love it. You can watch videos of classrooms where they do the whole book and it's just, it's just fantastic. So you'll see that resource page coming up. Uh, food is your child's best medicine. It's your adult's best medicine as well. We want to bring kids in on food prep of thinking of what to eat, menu planning if you can, food shopping, food prep, cleanup, and then how your family eats matters. When anxious kids, sometimes the anxiety really comes out around food as we move into teenagers, eating disorders, we know is a very, very big problem. We want to really set our intention. Who are we eating with? Where? How fast? What else are we doing while we eat? Here are a few games that we like to play at the dinner table to get shy kids to talk more, anxious kids. The anxious kid in the family gets to go first. We play high, low cheer. Tell us something good about your day, something bad about your day, and give out a cheer for somebody else in the family. Two truths and a lie, it's kind of self-explanatory. Each person gets to tell two truths and a lie about the day. Everybody else gets to figure out which one's which. 
Uh, rosebud thorn is, is a little bit like high low cheer. The bud is sort of something you're looking forward to tomorrow. The rose is what, what worked well today. The thorn is what was kind of a pain in your butt today. In terms of what you're eating, anxious kids, we want to get them off their food allergens. We want to decrease the processed foods, refined sugars. Um, an otherwise healthy diet with whole grains, vegetables, fruit, nuts and seeds, healthy oils, full fat dairy, lean meat, fish. These are all foods that are also going to help with anxiety. We also want to pay attention to the microbiome, all of those good bacteria that live between the clavicles, the, 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 shoulder, the, the, the shoulder, top of your shoulders here, and into your, toward your hip bones, that whole area inside your belly. The microbiome is very related to many things in your body from your immune function to the way that you feel. And so the gut brain connection is just gaining and gaining in it's what we understand about it. You want to make sure your child's microbiome is as robust and diverse as possible. We can use probiotics. We can eat foods that are high in, in culture and fermentation. Um, and a lot of kids enjoy those foods. We also use, as naturopathic doctors, botanical medicines, things made from herbs. I, I mentioned earlier using a diffuser, using essential oil of lavender. Um, other botanicals that have been shown to be safe for kids and have a calming but not habit forming and non sedative effect are chamomile, passion flower, and lemon balm. And a lot of times I will use these with my little patients as well as my teenagers um, in a tincture form made in glycerin. So it's quite sweet and kids tend to like it and they can feel an immediate sense of calm. Nutritional supplements are part of many naturopathic doctors' practices. There are several that have been shown to be safe and effective for treating anxiety in children. Theanine which is an amino acid found in green tea and some mushrooms, helps calm the mind and helps with focus. And they make these in gummy format and also in capsules as kids get older. A lot of adults also use theanine. Omega-3 oils have also been shown to lower overall anxiety among many, many other benefits. Magnesium deficiency is associated with anxiety and supplementation has really been shown to help. So we will often Supplements are anxious kids with magnesium. The other uh, supplement we will sometimes use is a B complex, depending on uh, other symptoms a child may have. Homeopathy is another approach that many naturopathic doctors use. They love using it. I do myself with children because uh, it's easy to administer. And we can really give a, one homeopathic remedy for the whole child, individualized to the child. This is one where you would likely not so much be doing at home, but you would be seeking professional care. Um, the remedies take into account how the child experiences their anxiety, what makes it better, worse, uh, or worse, and how the anxiety is really contextualized in the rest of their overall health. Some of the most common homeopathic remedies for anxiety are listed here. Um, you can you can see those. Uh, acupuncture for anxiety in kids. There are wonderful, gentle, and effective, free no side effects. I love treatments like that. Easy to do, and you can teach kids to do them themselves. I've listed out here two points. One is called pericardium six, which is a couple of inches uh, toward the body from the, the wrist bend where the hand meets the wrist. And you can see in this picture, and you can do this on yourself and you can rub in small little circles like that. This area is known to help have a very calming effect. The other place is called yin tang. It's between the eyebrows, small little circles that can be rubbed there. Tapping or emotional freedom technique is, has gained a lot of popularity. There's some terrific research on tapping. There are uh, a total of seven uh, places, including uh, eight if you include the karate chop area of the, the side of the hand, that are tapped while saying, uh, sort of naming what the anxieties and fears are about in that moment, and then also giving some affirmation. So I love that it really focuses on positive self-talk, super easy to teach, uh, feels good. They're using it in some city school uh, systems right now, particularly in areas where children have been traumatized. They're using tapping as a way to really give kids some uh, an, another tool that they can use themselves. Counseling and therapy, you know, I always say to parents, you don't have to go it alone. We're, we're going to help you from the natural medicine perspective as much as we can, but psychological help with play therapy behavioral, cognitive behavioral therapy, art therapy, these are all things that have a long track record. It often will help parents get some more tools. 
how to work with the anxious child, particularly in the context of a family. Like what if you have another kid who's not anxious and they start feeling like, oh, the anxious kid gets all the attention or why can't we go to the park just because she'll freak out? So we really want, we don't, we want to do whatever we can to prevent sibling rivalry and to work within the context of families. So I, as I said earlier, naturopathic medicine works very, very well alongside other kinds of approaches. For our teen, parents of teens on the call, you know, social media, we, we now totally understand the research is clear. Um, there is a strong correlation with social media use and anxiety and depression in teenagers. So uh, we use contracts around phone use. I talk about how this is a, uh, a privilege, not a right to have a cell phone. And we really need to do whatever we can to work creatively to reduce access to social media. Part of how we do that is we keep kids engaged as much as possible with other activities. It's great if you can start them young, figure out what they like, what they're into and keep that going. And also introducing phone use uh, as little as possible and modeling that and, and being very overt. Okay, I'm putting my phone down now. I've been on my phone enough. I'm not picking my phone up anymore until after we're finished with dinner. And just articulating it, saying it, modeling it. Kids are going to learn way more from what we do than from what we say. And it, you know, what I would really just share is that anxious kids often become anxious adults. And if we can give kids the tools they need to raise their threshold for feeling stressed. So learning how to uh, be committed to exercise, learning some mindfulness approaches, learning what they can do in terms of their diet. These are tools that they can take through their life and which encourage really over time, emotional resilience and self-acceptance and, and, and a capacity to quiet the mind. So, you know, naturopathic medicine has so much to offer anxious kids and hopefully help them prevent to become anxious adults. Dr. Amy Rothenberg and folks out there, uh, thank you very much for your patience for the technical difficulties at the beginning of the show, but that was amazing. Um, I am going to ask a couple questions uh, of you. I, you know, I have never heard of the word self-agency. So would you talk more about that? Oh, yes, you bet. Self-agency is the capacity to sort of want something and go for it. So you see self-agency in a, in a crawling toddler who's 11 months old and they want that biscuit that's on the floor over there and they crawl over and they get it and they put it in their mouth. That is self-agency. Self-agency is the kindergartner who decides that they kind of like that the girl over there who they like what she's doing on the monkey bars. And so they go over and they say, can I play with you on the monkey bars? It's wanting ah. something and going after it. So self-agency in a teenager is like, I'm really into sports. I know I want to have a career in sports. I'm going to get up my gumption, even though it's, I'm so nervous and I'm going to ask the basketball coach in my high school, if I can be an assistant, you know, help him out in whatever he needs. That is self-agency. And so you can see the people who have the most self-agency are the people who have not been criticized a lot and not been second guessed all their life. If a kid comes down and they're wearing stripes and plaids and the colors don't match or this is on, you know, you don't have to correct them. You can just say, wow, love the outfit. Unless it's dangerous to them or dangerous to somebody else, don't keep correcting your kids. Don't try to mold them so much that they have no self-agency. And you can yeah. see this in the people who don't go after what they want in life. They just sit more passively because they've never felt empowered to make their own decisions without being criticized. And, and then wow. a lot of people who are anxious, this is at the core of their anxiety. Makes sense. Yeah, it's great. It's a great term and I, I completely understand it now. Um, so you went over so much, I mean, different modalities from diet to mindful meditation, to homeopathy, to nutritional supplements, to botanical medicine. Um, and I do want to let everybody know you're gonna, this is gonna be recorded, you're gonna see the slides. Um, you can always go to naturemed.org. Uh, we have all of our online house boards recorded. But Dr. Rothenberg, where should somebody start if they're realizing, especially in these times uh, where their child is starting to be a little bit anxious, what do you recommend people do to start with? Right. If people can, they should pick up the phone or go online and find a naturopathic doctor they can work with. That's the first thing they should do because it's hard to treat your own child. It's hard to see the forest for the trees. It's hard to create a comprehensive plan that you know has some science behind it, efficacy proven and results. If, and, and right now, so many naturopathic doctors are offering telemedicine services 
So it's easier than ever if you can to find a naturopathic doctor. Short of that, I would say if you could only do one thing, the first thing you should do is get your kid exercising. Get out for a walk, get out the door, get away from the screens and do something that is aerobic, that gets the heart rate up and that lasts for at least a half an hour. That would be number one. Number two, I think the second thing would be to have the serious conversation with all the adults in the house about limiting screen time. And I know during the pandemic, this is not a popular concept, but I do feel like in general, this is something we really need to be, we need to be talking about. The screen time is is not good. And as kids get older, it's worse because it shifts over to social media. The third thing I would say is to think about some of the dietary and supplements that I talked about. They're easy to find. You're not going to hurt your child by trying those. And sometimes if you can get a little bit better with the anxiety, then the child will be more open to trying other new things. Like we're going to learn how to do alternate nostril breathing today. We're all going to learn how to do it. And then you put on the YouTube video of alternate nostril breathing and everybody learns it. And the thing about the mindfulness approaches is that if you practice them and you learn them five minutes a day practice, I mean, everybody has five minutes. Then when you're feeling especially anxious because that person called or the test is coming or there was a fire in the neighborhood or whatever the anxiety is, then you can use that skill because you have practiced it. You know, it's, it's a kind of thing like we don't just practice these things for no reason. We want access to them when we need them. So those are some basic ways that I think I would start. That's right. And, and some of the questions that are coming in, I should say, probably lend to that same point. Because one of them was, how do I know if my child's behavior is caused by, uh, by a physical issue or circumstance, or even perhaps part of a normal development. I think that, once again, you would be looking at getting some uh, medical advice to be able I, to I think differentiate. That's true. I think that's true. I think that's true. You know, certain certain behaviors are, are normal for certain ages. Like, I've, I always have parents of toddlers say to me, I think he must have OCD. All he wants to do is, like, line his trucks up in a row. Or she, all she wants to do is lie the dolls down in this particular way. She thinks, you know, OCD. Like, well, that's kind of a normal part of development. Uh, organ- organizational part of the brain. Now, do kids on the autistic spectrum tend to line things up like that and that persists? Yes, so, so it's not normal to keep doing that. So knowing what's normal, knowing what's not normal. And the internet can be helpful in terms of, there, there are some wonderful sites. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has uh, a whole listing of what are developmental milestones your child should be reaching by what age. And you can really, you can use those to just make sure. And if you have any questions, A naturopathic doctor certainly can help. Your pediatrician can help. Um, You you know, if a kid is anxious because they don't feel well, children that live with chronic disease, children with cancer, children with rheumatoid arthritis, chronic migraines, some of those kids are going to be anxious. Not all of them. Some are going to be depressed. Some of them are going to be irritable. Some of them are going to be pretty even keeled emotionally. It's, It's really everybody is an individual. And one of the beautiful components of naturopathic medicine that I think a lot of us practitioners really stand by is this concept of individualizing the treatment to the patient in front of you. We are looking to stimulate that person's capacity to come back to a better state of balance for them. And it's an individual treatment plan. So most of the things I spoke about today were quite general and they can be used to good effect, but working with somebody one-on-one, you can really go a little deeper and have a more specific plan for your child, your teenager. Yeah. And besides having these recordings on naturemed.org, you can also find a licensed naturopathic doctor on naturemed.org as well. So Amy, thank you so much. Since we didn't get to hear my introduction of you, can you tell the participants just a bit about yourself, please? <laughs> uh, let's see. And, I, and my whole thing, I'm just sitting here with this one picture. I, was, I speak a lot with my hands and facial expressions, so I'm sorry that you I have the opportunity to share that. Um, Let's see, I've been in practice for 34 years with my wonderful, brilliant husband, uh, Paul Herskew. And we we live in Western Mass, and uh, we were very involved with the effort to license naturopathic doctors in the state, which happened a few years ago, which we're very proud of of that effort. Um, I write a lot, public-facing pieces for the profession. If you've had the problem, I've probably written about it (laughs) uh, somewhere in one format or another. Um, I teach quite a lot in the world of natural medicine, both to naturopathic doctors interested in learning um, more about homeopathy, and I also teach to other kinds of providers and to the general public around naturopathic approaches to all kinds of problems. I'm a, I'm a three-time cancer survivor, 
Um, I speak a lot about the role of naturopathic medicine during conventional cancer care uh, and what to do after you finish treatment. Now what? I love talking to people about that. And, you know, I just feel personally very blessed to have found this profession at a very young age and to have had the opportunity to meet so many amazing people through the world of naturopathic medicine. That's awesome. Well, we are super lucky to have you, and so are the participants here. Folks, I'm Dr. Holly Lucille, uh, Chair of the Institute for Natural Medicine Board, and just thank you so much for being part of our uh, this, this, this edition of the online house call, and look out for more. And once again, www.naturemed.org. You can find a whole bunch of information there, and we'll see you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.